Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good, good morning to some. Um, welcome to our first installment of 2021 of our uh, webinar series, New York State and Local Tax of Mind. Um, our topic for this year, for this installment, is a discussion of Governor Cuomo's fiscal year-end 2021 executive budget, which was released just a few weeks ago. Before we begin, um, as we normally do, we're just going to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, first, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit your question through the Q&A window. If we do not get to your question during the webinar, our presenters will follow up with you via email after the program. Additional materials are in the resource list window on your console. You can find a copy of the program slides and supporting handouts there. Um, and a recording of today's webinar will be available and emailed to you approximately one day after the program. With that, uh, we will kick off our presentation. So on our agenda today, um, we wanted to highlight you know, what we think are, are probably the most relevant for our audience um, proposals that were included in the governor's executive budget. Um, we're going to be going through the proposals for a voluntary entity level tax um, meant to be used as a workaround for the SALT deduction limitation. Um, We've seen a revival of the proposal to give the Department of Taxation and Finance the right to appeal adverse tribunal decisions, whereas right now um, they cannot appeal a, a determination by the tribunal. Um, the elimination of hybrid S elections in New York, um, meaning that all federal S corporations would now be treated as New York State S corporations. Um, a proposal for the requirement of all facilitators of vacation rentals to collect sales tax on the full charge for the accommodation. Um, Jeremy is going to talk about this in more detail, um, but um, th this has to do with, you know, as the department says, trying to even the playing field between hotels and the Airbnbs and VRBOs and such um, of the world, um, and then being subject to the same taxes in New York. Um, next, we've got a temporary high income personal, high income, personal income tax surcharge um, being imposed on, on the highest earners in New York. Um, and then we have uh, proposals for the legalization and taxation of recreational cannabis and the authorization of mobile sports betting, um, both that include uh, taxes, potential taxes as revenue raisers. We're also going to spend just a few minutes going over um, advertising tax proposals and specifically digital advertising tax proposals in New York. Um, those didn't make it into the governor's executive budget, but still worthy of a few minutes of discussion because we are seeing them percolate um, around in New York and around the country as well. Um, there are a few other, um, you know, a handful of other proposals um, that we're not going to be talking about today from the governor's budget. Um, a few of them may be worth, I'll mention in just about 30 seconds, but um, there is a, a proposal to increase the withholding tax penalty um, on erroneously filed withholding tax reconciliations. Um, that's a little interesting given the fact that I think everyone's a little confused with how withholding will be done um, now and probably into the future on uh, telecommuters if that issue isn't kind of hammered out. Um, then there's also a proposal that um, as of right now, the department has three months to sit on a sales tax refund claim um, without issuing it before they have to start paying interest. Um, and the proposal includes extending that period to six months for refund claims of over a hundred thousand um, so, dollars. So that I think would you know impact anyone putting in a refund claim. And just imagining that the department will take more time and won't see as much interest coming through. Um, so that that's the introduction. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Jeremy um, to talk a little bit about the first of the proposals. Thanks, Jen. And so we're going to start with one of the real pure policy-based proposals that doesn't have a uh, revenue number attached to it, and that is the department's right to appeal tax tribunal decisions. So by way of background, since its inception in 1986, the tribunal served as an independent body reviewing determinations from the Division of Tax Appeals. And since then, taxpayers have had a mechanism to appeal adverse tribunal decisions to the third department of the Supreme Court Appellate Division, which is New York's General Jurisdiction Intermediate Court of Appeals. The department, however, has not been afforded that same appeal right. 
Thus, tribunal decisions that are adverse to the department are final and are binding precedent on both the department and all New York taxpayers. And taking a, taking a step back, this, this kind of quirk in the system may explain why there's certain instances where the department doesn't appeal adverse DTA decisions because those DTA decisions are only binding on the applicable taxpayer and are not precedent on all taxpayers. And the budget bill proposes to grant the same appeal rights to the department that have previously been reserved exclusively to taxpayers. And it's worth noting this isn't the first time that the governor has included this proposal in his budget. And the rationale underlying the proposal is that the department's inability to appeal decisions is a flaw in the statute and contravenes the independent nature of the tribunal. And the proposal argues the only recourse the department has to remedy those adverse decisions is to seek legislative fixes. And this raises the unique fact pattern that arose in the Lewis case that we've discussed previously, where the tribunal had held that a 338 H10 election made after a previous tribunal decision in Bonham and before the issuance of the retroactive legislation that invalidated the Baum decision should actually be governed by its own tribunal decision rather than the retroactive legislation. And so understandably, that wasn't welcome that the tribunal was kind of resorting to its own previous decision as opposed to applying this retroactive legislation. And the other point raised in support of allowing the department to appeal adverse tribunal decisions is that certain issues the tribunal rules on are beyond the scope of the New York legislature to remedy. And the two areas that have, this has arisen in are in regard to ERISA and two cases that were interpreting the tax treaty between the United States and Germany. It is worth noting that these issues represent a very, very, very small minority of cases the tribunal handled, as there's been three cases in the 35-year history of the tribunal that were beyond the scope of the legislature to remedy. And so there's policy arguments in both directions here, including the fact that the tribunal was set up this way on purpose and has remained this way for 35 years. And further, the judges deciding the matters at the tribunal are tax experts and only hear tax matters, whereas the appeals go before judges without the same level of tax expertise. And there is, there is an argument on the side that taxpayers may favor this approach that because if the department has the right to appeal, there is the real possibility that right now when the tribunal is confronting two positions that are approximately equal and only one of those parties has the right to appeal, the tribunal may decide against taxpayers such that it's incumbent on them to appeal. But on the other hand, taxpayers big and small have certainly expressed concerns regarding this proposal and the department's boundless resources to appeal adverse decisions should that right be granted. And it could allow the department to use litigation costs to drive taxpayers into unfavorable settlements. And Finally, the legislative history does provide some guidance in this area that the tribunal was created to provide taxpayers with an independent adjudicative body to more rapidly resolve tax disputes. And by giving the department the right to repeal, you are in danger of really reducing the rapidity with which these problems can be resolved. So we'll next discuss uh, the proposal to eliminate S corporation elections. Uh, so under current law, generally uh, eligible corporations that are treated as S corporations under federal law uh, must make a separate election to be treated as a New York S corp. Um, for the S corporation to be valid, the corporation must meet the following requirements. First, it must be a federal S corp. Uh, second, must be subject to tax under either uh, Article 9A or Article 32 of the New York tax law. And third, all of the corporation's shareholders must consent uh, to the election. The proposed budget includes you know, major change that would remove the necessity for an S corporation election. Uh, specifically, the budget proposes that all federal S corps are treated as New York S corps uh, automatically. The budget states that this change would, would address 
tax avoidance in cases where shareholders uh, change their residence to avoid paying tax on dividends. Um, with respect to the projected impact this change will have um, on, on revenue figures, the proposal uh, in the budget states that combined with the repeal of the Article 9 tax on foreign buses, uh, the S Corporation reform will result in an increase in revenue of about $6 million in fiscal year 2023. So next, Jen will walk us through the pass-through entity tax and personal income tax surcharge proposed in the budget. Awesome. Thanks, George. Um, so the first one, the pass-through entity tax. Um, so this is, um, as I mentioned, intended to be a workaround to the $10,000 SALT deduction limitation. And that was put into effect in 2017 as part of uh, federal tax reform. Um, as a little bit of background, um, you know, states have been working to try and figure out how to, you know, work around that $10,000 limitation. And New York tried a few different things with um, charitable deductions, um, some, some payroll taxes, and they never really took off. Um, what other some other states had done, including some neighboring states, Connecticut um, and New Jersey, of them. Uh, put put on their books um, a pass-through entity tax. Most of those other states were elective. Connecticut's um, is mandatory. But basically so that um, partnerships and S corporations would pay tax at the entity level. Um, and then in, individual owners would receive a credit for taxes that they were owed. Thereby, um, individuals still basically got the benefit of the deduction without having it to apply towards their $10,000 deduction limitation. Um, in, Fed, in October of 2020, the IRS put out a notice whereby it basically sanctioned this workaround um, for all intents and purposes, said, you know, we think this works. Um, since then, there were a few soft proposals um, and draft legislation floating around New York. Um, and, and we did see one pop up as part as the governor's executive budget. Uh, the specific proposal that's on the books right now is for an elective tax that applies to partnerships and S corporations. Um, but interestingly, and those partnerships and S corporations are only eligible if they have solely individual owners. Um, so that's, that's pretty limiting as it's written right now. Um, the tax would be imposed um, really on ordinary income as well, and then provides a corresponding credit to the individual owners. Uh, it would be effective um, 2022, so I think that would give some time for the state to hammer out the details about, you know, forms and how this would work. Um, and I, I think also gives them time to see if, you know, in some way at the federal level, this um, $10,000 limitation goes away in the next year, and then this workaround wouldn't be necessary. Um, so um, more to come to see on, on if this makes its way into the final legislation, and if so, if, if some changes are made to it. Um, second, the personal income tax surcharge. Um, this is a big one um, because it doesn't apply to a huge amount of people, but um, you'll see we have listed, they projected this to be worth of $4 billion in revenue. Um, over a three-year period. So, so this is huge. I mean, the governor's come out and said that he doesn't really want to do this, but um, unless there is, you know, funding coming in from other other ways, you know, basically a federal bailout um, to New York as well, I think something like this is going to have to go through. So it's um, being proposed as a temporary tax um, for three years um, at the rate of half a percent to two percent um, in addition to the tax, personal income tax already on the books for taxpayers with income over $5 million. Um, the rate gradually increases, you know, based on every additional $5 million of income. And this is actually, um, it, it's done such that there's a cliff. That's the way the legislation is currently drafted. So that if you have, um, you know, $1 more of income, all of your income becomes subject to a, a higher tax rate. So. Um, you know, there are some requests for clarification to make sure that's what the department intended, but it seems right now that that's what they did. And um, the department also put into the proposal, um, or I should say the, legislat the legislature put into the proposal, um, a benefit for prepayment to try and incentivize taxpayers to prepay um, New York State um, and then get a deduction um, in beginning in 2024, such that they would basically get um, a 50% discount on the tech tax that was owed. Sounds nice, but I'm not sure how many people are going to be jumping to give uh, New York State their money and trusting how quickly they'll be getting it back. So um, 
I understand that there's about a New York says there's about 180,000 people impacted um, by this, so a pretty small percentage. But uh, you know, those are those high net worth individuals that um, may have some lobbying power, and you know, are the same individuals threatening to leave the state. So um, we will see what what comes of that. Next up, um, we've got sales tax on vacation rentals, Jeremy. Yeah, from four billion dollars in tax revenue to ten to eighteen million, uh, going down a little bit. So, uh, part I of the governor's budget proposes to impose a sales tax on vacation rentals and require those vacation rental marketplace providers. We know them as Airbnb, VRBO, et cetera, to collect that sales tax on the taxable sales of the vacation rentals that they facilitate. And this has been a pretty hot button issue, not just in New York, but across the country as these, uh, what, what New York is taking to call them vacation rental marketplace providers kind of eat into a lot of the traditional hotel base and the traditional hotel tax system isn't necessarily equipped to deal with this transition. And so this proposal is meant to update New York's tax law to impose sales tax on the vacation rentals and to address the high prevalence of the rentals that are made through these marketplaces by imposing the $1.50 New York City hotel unit fee on these rentals. And under the current law, sales tax and the hotel unit fee are only imposed on the rental of hotel occupancy and not on the rental of real property. And so the hotel unit fee is separate from the sales tax and must be separately stated on a customer's receipt. And so presently, it just isn't really clear whether the definition of a hotel used for sales tax and hotel unit fee purposes encompasses a vacation rental. So in that sense, this clarification is welcome given how the number of people this affects both the vendors as well as those of us that use the Airbnbs, VRBOs, the world. And so under the tax law, hotel is a building or portion of it, which is regularly used and kept open as such for the lodging of guests, including an apartment hotel, motel, boarding house, club, whether or not meals are served. And the regulations currently flesh out that a hotel excludes, quote, bungalows and other similar living facilities from the definition of a hotel. And the exclusion depends on a landlord-tenant relationship uh, which is evidenced by the lack of common hotel amenities like housekeeping, food, entertainment, linen service. And the other thing kind of operating in the background is the existing rule for marketplace providers as to the retail sale of tangible personal property, which is also a relatively new addition to the tax law. And under those rules, a marketplace seller and marketplace provider deemed to be the vendor for purposes of tax collection. And so, the budget proposes to amend several sections of the sales tax law so that to impose the sales tax and the hotel unit fee on vacation rentals and require vacation rental marketplace providers to collect sales tax on the vacation rentals that they facilitate. And in an attempt to address or deal with the bungalow exclusion I, I just mentioned, the term vacation rental would specifically include a bungalow regardless of the provision of meals or housekeeping or concierge or linen services, which you, you typically don't get at your run-of-the-mill Airbnb. And as you can see on the slide, the, the, the term vacation rental is, is defined fairly broadly to include a building or a portion of it which is used to lodge guests, including house, apartment, condo, co-op, cabin, cottage. And it's, it's really casting a pretty wide net, making sure that it, it attempts to capture just about any, any place that you would, you would find when scrolling Airbnb. And the proposal also outlines that a vacation rental marketplace provider has the same obligations and rights as a vendor, including the duty to collect and remit tax. And, but on the other hand, the 
proposal relieves operators of vacation rentals from registering and collecting sales tax in the hotel unit fee, which it, it, is, it is a welcome, welcome addition considering that you may be renting out an apartment for a few, few nights a year and it, if the law were drawn differently, you might be responsible for registering to collect and remit tax when you're just trying to get a little extra income while you're out of the city or out of the state. And so there are potential concerns with this regarding how this applies to rentals and real property, which are historically excluded from tax, such that a determination of a rental of real property versus a vacation rental relationship would need to be determined without resorting to kind of the typical things that are associated with a hotel that, like I mentioned, like a concierge or linen service. And, you know, there's, when, when proposing any of these new taxes, I think that a lot of taxpayers welcome some more specificity and guidance to better understand how this is really going to be implemented. And to, to wrap up, as I mentioned, at the, at the outset, this is not a large revenue raiser in the context of the state budget. It is only projected to increase revenue by 10 million for fiscal year 2022, and then 18 million annually thereafter. And so now we're next on to probably one of the headliners of the budget, maybe not from a tax perspective, but certainly from a policy perspective, is that the governor is again proposing to legalize, regulate, and tax recreational adult use cannabis. And this was part of the executive budget last year in fiscal year 2021, and obviously gained a lot of headlines and wasn't enacted. And so the governor is back, back at it again. And while the current proposal is certainly modeled on the proposal from last year, there are some important differences. And just by way of quick background, uh, the use of recreational cannabis is illegal in New York, as well as at the federal level, but we're not gonna be getting into the myriad federalism questions that arise from legalizing cannabis at the state level and how that interacts with federal law. But the use of medical cannabis is allowed in New York and the tax imposed on medical cannabis is 7% of the gross receipts from, um, from the medical cannabis sold by a registered organization. And the proposed legalization of adult use cannabis includes a bevy of licensing and registration requirements, but we're just going to narrowly focus on the tax aspects. And interestingly, the bill provides for three separate taxes on adult use cannabis sales in New York. And so the first is your garden variety sales tax. And the sales tax would be amended to clarify that the retail sale of adult use cannabis is subject to the general sales tax imposed on the retail sale of tangible personal property under tax law 1105. And this is actually a departure from last year, which didn't apply the statewide sales tax. And the second tax is a THC-based tax, so a, a, a potency tax. And this tax is levied according to the milligrams of total THC that is present in the cannabis product with a different rate based on the product. So the tax is imposed on the sale from the wholesaler to the retailer but if the wholesaler is the retailer, the tax is imposed on the retail sale. And so you get something that looks like uh, edibles are taxed at four cents per milligram of THC and 0.7 cents per milligram of THC in cannabis flowers is the tax imposed. And so you're gonna have a uh, very different re tax regime than what we're accustomed to. And the third tax is a 10.25% retail sale surcharge that is imposed on the retail sale to the ultimate consumer. And so finally, the proposal provides for tax returns to be kept secret and modifies portions of the tax on medical marijuana to ensure that tax returns and information aren't shared with the federal government, which is a nod to the existing 
federalism questions in relation to states legalizing something that is not legal at the federal level. And there are some other provisions we're thinking about, such as New York's conformance to IRC Section 280E, which prevents cannabis businesses from taking deductions or credits that are allowed for other businesses because cannabis remains a Schedule I drug at the federal level. And I think taking one step back beyond the tax law, there are a lot of other changes in New York's law that are part of this, changing public health laws, vehicle and traffic laws, penal laws, criminal procedure. But the real bottom line here is that while this is a policy proposal, it does stand to potentially raise a fairly significant amount of revenue. And while the projections are fairly low for fiscal year 2022 at just 20 million, the governor is projecting that number to grow exponentially to the point where you are seeing to over 250 million in fiscal year 2025 and 374 million in fiscal year 2027. And so in addition to being uh, a, a policy proposal, he's kind of microwaving again after it fell short last year. I think that this is something that can be pointed to as trying to patch the budget gap that has arisen in a much more significant way than something like the sales tax on vacation rentals. And another one of those uh, policy proposals where New York is trying to catch up with several other states is the governor's proposal to legalize and tax mobile sports betting. And so presently, you like me have probably been inundated with ads both online and when watching a sporting sporting game that you can go and bet using DraftKings FanDuel. And presently, online sports wagering is legal in 14 states. And most importantly, for New York's purposes, that includes New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And I don't know about you, but I have at least heard stories of New Yorkers that hop on the train and get off at the first stop in New Jersey to place their bets on their phone because you can't do it inside of New York. There's a geolocator in the app and you have to be within the state's borders in order to place the bet. And so you get off at the first stop in New Jersey, place your bet, and immediately go to the other side of the tracks and return to the city. And it turns out the stories that we've all been hearing about that are backed up by data. And the governor's memorandum in support of the, this budget proposal cites a study finding that almost 20% of the online sports wagering in New Jersey comes from New York residents. And so the reading of that is New York is losing out on millions in tax revenue, and this is a way to stop that. And interestingly, New York already allows sports betting, but it has to be done in person. So this proposal really only expands what's already provided. And the governor proposes that the state's gaming commission will issue an RFP to license mobile and online sports betting operators that have a pre-existing partnership with a licensed New York casino. And this, this approach is different from many other states that have allowed casinos to run their own mobile sports betting operations. And this, this approach being run more through the, the state lottery is similar to the operator models that have been adopted in Oregon, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Washington, D.C. And so the revenue generated from mobile sports wagering will be separately maintained and deposited in the state lottery fund. And it is, it is interesting to note that this proposal does potentially ignore state constitutional issues arising from the provision that allows gambling at casinos, but it remains unclear to many whether this proposal would actually withstand scrutiny regarding whether mobile sports wagering is covered by the state constitutional provision that allows sports betting at casinos. And so the governor, the governor cites a fairly aggressive revenue target in that he suspects $500 million 
will be raised annually, quote, when the full potential is realized. And so th this projection may be a bit aggressive as New Jersey right now realizes just slightly more than 300 million in tax revenue. So in the event that this does become part of the budget and you are able to engage in mobile sports betting in New York, it remains to be seen what the real tax impact of that will be. Okay, so finally, we have some, some new taxes proposed by the legislator, which weren't included in the budget, but we thought uh, we should discuss. So the first is the digital ad tax, uh, which, uh, which act would impose a new tax on gross revenues derived from digital advertising services. Um, those services are pretty broadly defined to include advertisement services on a digital in interface. They include banner and search engine ads on the internet. Um, the tax rate begins at about two and a half percent of the base for persons uh, with between 100 million and $1 billion of global annual gross revenues and scales up to 10% uh, on the base for persons with global annual gross revenues exceeding $15 billion. Um, this proposal is similar to other proposals and enacted legislation in other states. Um, including Maryland, uh, where the governor actually vetoed the legislation, and the state legislator both voted on an override uh, to the governor's veto. While the New York bill is sitting in the state Senate Budget and Revenue Committee, um, we've heard that the proponents are waiting to see the outcome of similar proposals and might hold off pending, you know, legislation uh, challenges, you know. Uh, where these cases go if lawsuits are filed in, in states like Maryland. Um, second proposal we've included is just a tax on broadband internet access services. Um, the revenue earned from what they're calling this annual charge uh, would go to fund an e-learn program, which would help provide students with free internet access. So we've included that as well. Um, next, uh, we'll you know, conclude our presentation with a polling question. Uh, so please review the responses and, and enter your uh, applicable response in the window on the screen. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so that was you know, our overview of the governor's executive budget. Just uh, kind of some procedural reminder, 30-day um, amendments will be coming out any day now. Um, after that, there could still be some uh, changes to the proposal as well. Um, and for a timely budget, um, it should be signed by March 31st. Um, so that's when we will you know, have a clear answer of what exactly makes its way into um, legislation in New York for the year uh, and what the finalized budget looks like. So um, more on this then. We'll certainly report back on, on what makes its way in um, and what new issues we'll all be grappling with in the future. So uh, if you had any questions that we didn't get to, we can follow up with you or our contact information is on the screen. Feel free to contact myself, Jeremy, or George, and we're happy to discuss with you anything further. Thanks so much, and we look forward to uh, meeting with you guys again on our next installment of our webinar series. Have a great day.